Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this week's meeting of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley, where every week we bring you an inspirational message focused on education, entrepreneurship, and innovation. Uh, this week's program is extra, extra special. I'm sure you enjoy it, and I'll pass it on to Rushton, who will, do, um, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Sviatko. Our speaker today is Lord Jim Knight, who has been kind enough to say, hey, just call me Jim. That's a lot better. And we're, we're good with that as well. He works in education, med tech, and as a legislator, he is the chief education and external officer at TES Global, uh, something we may hear a little bit more about as we go through the, go through the recording. And as a UK government minister with the House of Lords, his portfolios include rural affairs, schools, digital, and employment. He asks provocative questions about education, mainly along the lines of, is it prepared to help our students deal with the future that is to come? So Jim, it is a pleasure to have you here and we are excited about your message. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, really pleased to be able to join you in your various locations around uh, the world. And um, I will launch straight into what I want to say so that we can maximize time. And I'm going to uh, present uh, from uh, here now. Uh, just bear with me while I try and get move. Ah, there we go. So what I wanted to talk about was essentially achieving the inconceivable, um, which is to get the education and uh, skills ecosystems to match the labor market as Rushton said in the introduction, um, I was for three minutes, three years a schools minister, the schools minister for the UK, uh, followed by a year in Gordon Brown's cabinet as the employment minister in a post crash time when we had to do something about youth unemployment in particular. Um, and at that point, I had this, you know, what should have been an, a, an obvious realization, I guess, that the mistakes I might have made as schools minister were coming back to bite me. Um, in trying to align the needs of uh, young people in and their skills with labor market demand. And um, that's driven a passion for me in the intervening, what's now 10 years, um, around whether or not essentially our school system is fit for purpose. Um, but what I, uh, what I want to do is start with uh, my stepdaughter, Coco. And Coco is... Um, She's eight years old. She's in our year four uh, in a local uh, state-funded primary school uh, in London. And when I've been asked to think about educational change, people have often talked to me about, you know, what's my vision for 2030? Well, you know, I have skin in the game because Coco will leave statutory education um, in 2030 at the age of 18. So I think about these things to some extent through the lens of my role as a parent. And I think when we are thinking about education and education reform, too often we leave our parent at the door if we are one. And I think it's quite important to bring the consumer, the parent, into the room and into our thinking. Now, you know, Coco is, uh, as I say, in an ordinary uh, state-funded school. and that runs according to a paradigm that's very much the same as it was when I went to school, which is you, s you sit in a classroom, you listen to the teacher, you pay attention. If you do well, uh, you will pass some tests uh, and then you can go to university and then all being well, you'll get a great job and a great career. And uh, yet there are problems with that model. Uh, TEARS, which is the business that I work for, has been writing journalism about education for the last hundred years. But this edition from two years ago, uh, almost to the day, talks about the missing 47,000 secondary teachers. And you know, to put that into perspective, there are about 450,000 teachers in our state funded system. So we're looking at having a huge hole in the numbers. Uh, because we're not recruiting enough and we are not retaining enough professionals in order to meet the needs of the system as it's currently designed and that's particularly acute 
in maths and physics and some of the other sciences, and particularly acute in some parts of the country. So yeah, how are we going to fill uh, that gap? Well, some people argue that we fill the gap by replacing teachers with robots and that if we get machines and computers to do the teaching and that's something that's particularly current with lockdown right now then maybe that will do we can still continue to fill our children's minds with content and test them at the end and then they can go to university and, and get a great career but my sense is that if we teach them with robots we are teaching them to be replaced by robots because robots are far better at content recall than people are and if that's what education is just about then i think we're storing up a huge problem for our young people and so i do ask the question whether our education system is fit for purpose and what do young people themselves say they're complaining to me that there are too many tests they're spending too much time preparing for tests and sitting tests and all of the conversation about learning is about test preparation and doing well in your tests and test scores and then they're saying and if i do well in those tests and go to university can i afford it yeah i'm gonna in in this country in the uk that's fifty thousand pounds worth of debt that i'm taking on for the privilege of getting a bachelor's degree. I was talking to Coco's favorite babysitter and Harry went to a state funded school. He got a scholarship for his last two years of statutory education to a private school, did really well, went to Oxford, did a physics degree at Oxford University, um, arguably, well, it's certainly in the top five universities in the world. Uh, he then did a master's um, at uh, Imperial College in something too clever in software engineering for me to understand and he now has a, a very fine job um, in drone programming uh, in London um, as a, a graduate with a new master's degree. I asked him what proportion of his income he is repaying in debt and he told me that uh, for the first you know if for 20 to 25,000 pounds worth of income, he pays 9% and everything over 25,000 pounds, he pays um, an additional 6% uh, in, um, in debt repayment. It's a 15% debt repayment. Now, if I add that to his income tax and the national insurance, insurance he pays for things like our national health service here, he's ending up paying an effective marginal rate of tax right now of 48%. I don't think that that's fair or s sustainable. And then, obviously, we're asking, you know, our children are saying, and I might end up with a degree that will prepare me for a job that technology is just going to take away. Uh, and so, therefore, will my qualification be worth less or indeed worthless? So I have all of that debt for something that doesn't really count anymore. And then there are other things that I'm really worried about, uh, like the sustainability of the planet. And so you know, should you be surprised that so many young people are suffering mental health problems uh, right now, uh, not only in my country, but certainly in the US and across the Western world. And those I think should be really arresting for us in thinking about whether or not uh, schools need to change and I then look at the labor market where you know, traditionally hiring has been done on the basis of you know, CVs or resumes depending on which country we're in um, CV is a Latin word for curriculum vitae for those that don't speak in that language um, a lot of employers use graduate entry schemes uh, and then the traditional management model is to hire and fire and churn through talent and keep refreshing talent that way but my sense from many employers that I talk to is that that is crumbling, that we're replacing that form of recruitment with the use of analytics, where we are starting to be able to drill down into the data to understand the talent and then grow the talent. And there's a big expansion in learning development in the corporate world. And it makes so much more sense for a company like Starbucks you know, if you've been there for more than three months, as I understand it, they will fund you 
um, a degree at uh, Arizona State University, or AT&T now doing a deal with Udacity around micro-credentialing and degrees and, and that form of learning. Uh, Uber in London uh, funding drivers to be able to take degrees at the Open University as, as distance learning. There are many examples across the corporate world of companies investing in their talent and growing their own talent. And that all starts to undermine the business model of our universities. So the value of the qualification shrinks uh, and you couple that with debt. And I think the business model for our universities starts to go up in flames. And what that then means for our schools who haven't really changed since Victorian times is that that model is also uh, on a burning platform that demands change and demands us to ask what the post-industrial model is for schools, given that the model that we currently have was forged in an industrial age. And the, the current pandemic raises some questions around how quickly this could change. You know, the pandemic is going to create a massive recession globally, as far as we can tell. And the need for us to urgently do something about adult skills in particular is really pressing. If the disillusion with established politics in the Rust Belt of the US or in the periphery of and those sort of the industrial heartlands of the UK that you know in my analysis are the core reason why Trump and Brexit have happened. If they aren't enough of a warning shot to us, I don't know what is. But there are other effects I think of the pandemic. I think many parents are looking at what teachers doing do with new respect. Uh, because they're having to be teachers themselves and they're, they're finding that pretty crazy. Um, just being teachers for one or two people, let alone uh, uh, a class of 30. Uh, but they will also want to be more involved in, in a, a partnership between home and school. And then they're seeing what technology can and what it can't do. And I think they will raise, that will raise questions about what the right blend is between online and face-to-face -face learning in order to get the best quality education and then there's all those questions around digital literacy and whether or not you know in my country we have phone masts being firebombed because of uh, a fake news story that 5g is responsible for the coronavirus uh, we have to be able to urgently do something about digital literacy if we're using technology properly for learning but I think we should, and I go back to Ruben Puentadora's work um, over 10 years ago now um, as an East Coast academic, talking about what technology can do. And if you just use it uh, to substitute your old technology for new, if you just replace your blackboard with a whiteboard but don't use it any different, then there's no enhancement. Indeed, everything below that dotted line is a negative because you've got the time to turn the thing on, if nothing else, and it going wrong, whereas a blackboard uh, never goes wrong. Um, you might augment your practice slightly. You might use it as a projector. There might be a few things you do uh, differently, but frankly, uh, if you don't fundamentally modify or redefine your pedagogy and your practice, then technology is not going to do anything for you. And that sense of uh, redefinition to do the previously inconceivable is a concept that I often go back to and hang on to, to, to transform our learning. And when I look at what our teachers do all day, they're spending, uh, this is for the UK, but I, I guess it's not radically different in the US and in many other places. They're spending about a quarter of their time teaching. They're doing some other valuable stuff, but they're spending far too much time doing admin tasks, uh, doing data collection, doing marking. And a lot of those could be replaced by technology. And they're working really long hours. And if we can use artificial intelligence in particular and that form of technology to take some of that work away then we can release time that's currently spent in non-productive non-teaching time for the human activity uh, such as one-to-one -one activity with parents and pupils but there's obviously the important job of teaching in the classroom and some of the extracurricular work that they do and that uh, analysis that i did was incidentally 
borne out. I was gratified to see by some research that McKinsey's did, um, being paid far more money than I ever earned uh, to come up with the same outcome. Um, so I then think, yes, technology and artificial intelligence has a huge potential to help us uh, if we use it to enhance teachers, as long as we release our teachers um, from the straitjacket um, of accountability, uh, which is why I have Harry Houdini there um, in his straitjacket, all tied up as our teachers are every day in our classrooms. Because that can release more time for teachers to be human. And I warn you that the text that I'm revealing, I'm trying to remember because I've got pictures of all of you uh, blocking half of the text, but I'll do my best. Um, time for more balance around the social and emotional development alongside the cognitive. We are infatuated by the academic and the cognitive at the expense of really important human development. Allowing teachers to hyper differentiate um, their children and to use technology for assessment to have a more agile curriculum using different learning sorts of learning spaces and um, stage not age for learners so we're not artificially sorting learners by cohort as you know, my friend Sir Ken Robinson so uh, so poignantly points out in some of his very popular TED talks using I mean the assessment and the feedback that we get from technology could allow us to do that on the hoof without really having to worry so much about tests and you know in my country we spend billions of pounds every year in our schools on tests with the assessment industry and with an outcome of curious collaborative and critical learners which in my head is what the labor market really wants and how do we get there from a to b or from b to ai well i think employers will stop demanding qualifications they will use analytics and that in turn will force universities to move to new business models to more micro credentialing to more embedded learning with employers to, for more of those sorts of learning partnerships that i talked about earlier and at the same time i see parents demanding action on mental health they are concerned that they're having to kick their kids out from under the duvet every day and get them to work at best at worst We've got this exponential rise in suicide and self-harm amongst our, our young teenagers. And policymakers will have to respond to that. And that in turn, I hope, will free up the curriculum, will relax the accountability, and will also lead to some important um, safeguarding around what we're doing around the, um, the data that's being collected for learning for, to fuel this AI. And you know, I'm particularly interested in data trusts for ethical safeguarding. And then I hope we end up with a happy learning child. That's Coco this afternoon. I took this picture two hours ago. Um, she was out on the cliffs um, learning outside. Um, in this case, harvesting seaweed that we will eat for our supper from the rock pools. Um, but there was so much learning for her to have with the geology. She can see there, um, you know, the, the rocks there are 100 million years old and they lock in them the story of the history of our planet. Um, and uh, well, I could. I, there's a dike right next to that picture. They're right on the edge of that picture, which is a um, a, a geological feature that I can get quite excited about. Uh, a richness of learning that uh, we can have by just getting outside of school and engaging with the world around us. Uh, and I hope that that stimulates some conversation. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Jim. This was uh, such an excellent presentation. Very um, uh, interesting to, to hear your thoughts on uh, the need to modernize education so that it both uh, serves our students and, and learning better, but also equips them better for uh, today's society, especially with uh, even the challenges that uh, we're, we're facing nowadays with the current pandemic. Um, so uh, before we move into the Q&A, um, I'd like to just uh, make sure, Rushton, that we're on gallery view so that we can uh, see everybody here. Perfect. Uh, so I'd like to just uh, maybe introduce everybody very quickly. I'm just going to say your name and if you want to wave your hand and then we'll, uh, we'll move over to the Q&A. Um, so we already met Rushton, our charter president. Um, we have Rory on the call from, from uh, Texas as well. 
Um, we have Mike from New York. Uh, we have um, Manu um, from uh, Germany. Um, we have Shags over uh, from the Silicon Valley as well as Verheen. Uh, we have our early riser from Australia, Brett, on the call with us. Uh, then we have Sandy from California as well. Uh, we have uh, John and uh, Cecilia as well. Uh, so thank you everybody for, for joining the live recording here. And um, I'm I, really uh, pleased to see Brett still awake. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, just remember, as you ask your questions, um, keep them brief so that we give Jim more opportunity to, to answer. Um, I suspect there's going to be some uh, good interest here. We have a few educators um, uh, on, on the call as well. I know uh, Rush will probably have some good questions, Mark as well. Um, so uh, any uh, who would like to get us started with a question here? Okay, Rush, go ahead. I think it was Arthur C. Clarke who once said, any teacher who can be replaced by a computer should be. Uh, and, and, and I think about that in the context of how, how do we get our students to be creative, innovative sol problem solvers? And, and it seems like one of the things we need is to, uh, to better attract people to a different kind of professional atmosphere in a school. Uh, have you run across any models for changing the, the professional atmosphere for teachers such that it becomes a more attractive option for them? Uh, yes, uh, I'm afraid I think they're, they're few and far between because I'm afraid we have a, 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 the assessment tail that wags the school dog and uh, too many teachers feel like they're trapped in a machine that's just all about getting the grades. Um, but particularly actually, you know, you know I am a a Labour Party politician, so I would be described probably by some of your politicians as a socialist. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, you know, beware. But um, uh, I see some of the best examples of that in the private sector, in international schools in particular, and in international baccalaureate schools in particular, where um, there is a there is an ethos that's much more about that this is about learning. Uh, this isn't, you know, uh, and the tests will take care of themselves. And that that's where we need to get to. And, and I see some highly motivated teachers. You know, I see, I think teaching is the most brilliant profession and, and it's the largest single profession in the world. And I, I meet so many inspirational teachers, but I'm just impatient to release them uh, from those, those from, from the bondage that I showed in that talk. And, um, and then I think, uh, allowing them to set more of their own curriculum, to um, to use different forms of assessment. I don't think, you know, obviously the, there's the, the classic uh, school, high tech high in California, where they use exhibition as a quite an important part of, of their assessment of their accountability to their community. Uh, and I really like that. I really like that form. I, I, I look at uh, dance, music and drama, exams which we all accept the validity of but they're highly subjective where we're relying on the expertise of the examiner rather than the objectivity of there always having to be a right and the wrong answer and we should move assessment much more in that direction i think it's important that there is the accountability of assessment but we should be innovating in that space in order to free up more uh you know teachers to deliver those curious collaborative learners that, that, that we want our children to be and uh, you know, as a happy win-win, the labor market also values. Um, I think we have a, I think Manu was next and then uh, we'll, we'll go over to you, Mark. Um, uh, go ahead, Manu. Oh, thank you. Um, Jim, that was uh, uh, enlightening. It reminded me of uh, Joseph Beuys, one of Germany's uh, most influential artists of the last uh, uh, century in an interview was asked what the most beautiful uh, piece of art he could imagine uh, would be and he answered to uh, uh, educate a child uh, uh, in a good way would be the most uh, beautiful uh, piece of art. I had that feeling uh, while listening to you. Uh, my question though would be much more uh, uh, practical. 
Um, I spent three years in a research group uh, funded by, by our government on how business models change in education. And, and you mentioned that uh, in one point. And what was really interesting for me to see was that many European stakeholders in that research group could not accept the fact that new business models might come from different regions of the world that you might look into a, a, a school uh, somewhere in an uh, uh, African uh, context or uh, Asian context or South American, whatever, and they might be able to, to get better education done. Um, what's your feeling on that? Is, is that only my observation? And if not, how could that be changed that we might open ourselves up for re-importing uh, uh, educational uh, concepts from elsewhere? Uh, well, certainly there is some really interesting innovation happening elsewhere. And um, there's a, a guy I spent some time with uh, last year, Fred Swanaker, who set up the African Leadership Academy, which is a really good example. Um, he has a couple of campuses, one in Mauritius and one in Rwanda, but he's trying to move away from a campus-based university altogether. He has the modest ambition, given that I think... Uh, what is it, 30% of the world's population will be African in 2040, and he wants to have educated all of the leaders of Africa um, by then. Uh, and he has a, a, a model where he's not really that interested in prior attainment. Uh, he recruits in talents that he assesses and then develops them in a non-siloed, non-subject-based way to as problem solvers. Um, and he thinks that that's how he's going to develop leaders. He's a former McKinsey guy from, from Ghana. I look at Nicolas Sadarak, who's a Frenchman, who's developed uh, School 42, which is a, a coding school. Um, he's got a, a different uh, enterprise now, but again, that's private sector, no public funding at all, uh, and no prior attainment. He has 100% employability in, I think, 11 different countries now, 42, um, producing a 1,000 um, highly sought after software engineers in each of those locations um, every year um, with an extraordinary business model. Um, I'm responsible for setting up TES Institute in London where we are a teacher trainer, again private sector, um, where uh, as a result of the virus um, you know, we've suddenly opened up for free for anyone doing teacher training in our country who's unable to complete because completion required face-to-face -face learning and ours is a largely online model, and they've come to us in order to complete, and we will be responsible for uh, qualifying around half of the trainee teachers in our country this year because of that offer, because suddenly they're realizing the value of online. I also advise a private university who are based in Kuala Lumpur, in Sri Lanka, in Malta, in the UK, um, in Canada, I think. And they are doing part time uh, learning that's highly vocational, uh, undergraduate and postgraduate level, and that disproportionately is working for the poorest people in our society the gig economy workers, the bus drivers, and so on um, who need uh, an affordable, accessible, vocational, higher level of education. And we, that business is able to do it at an affordable level because it's not weighed down by the burden of a lot of tenured professors. And that's just a different business model. Um, and if our publicly funded universities don't appreciate uh, that challenge, then, then many of them will go under and that will be a catastrophe for the communities that they're in. Uh, you yeah, know, the big research-based universities will all be fine, and they have to be fine. They're a really important part of our economy. But, but there's a whole bunch of other universities that, frankly, are just there to churn out qualifications and to do a bit of teaching, and they deserve to be displaced. Thanks, Jim. Uh, good to hear that there are so many innovative models out there as well. Uh, so um, I see that we have a few questions in the chat, um, and uh, uh, Mark wanted to ask a question. I think I'm going to go to mark first um and if uh maybe we try and keep it somewhat brief and uh um so we can get as much of that on the recording and then we can stop the recording and continue i'll try and do briefer answers too yeah okay go ahead mark 
Great. Thank you, Jim. This has been fantastic. Um, in your, your previous comments, you, we talk, you brought about and we talk about innovative assessment. And in one of the projects you were just speaking about was, but we're still educating in the same way. And you were speaking specifically about non-siloed, non-subject specific education. And, and that is one of the things, because the, the question that I, I bring up continually is how can I create or, or help students to become creative and collaborative when all they do is come in and they collaborate about science, they collaborate about English. How do they do that when the world doesn't work in that way? Um, and, and just on a, and you can kind of multiple choice this one if you'd like, follow whichever passion you want to follow. The other thought that comes up to me is um, how critical words are in education at this point. And I'm wondering if you see a phase of losing the term teacher, which generally brings up for me someone who is the person in power and is bringing the education or the knowledge to the students and more towards something along the words of coach or facilitator of that education for those students, which then brings that to the students to bring it forward. And I'll leave you with okay. those two for the moment. Um, well, on the first, um, you know, we talk about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths um, obsessively here, and then occasionally people talk about STEAM, where you insert the arts in too. Um, I had a conversation about this with the president of the Royal Society, which is a highly established society here in the UK. And Savenki is a Nobel Prize winning um, scientist. And I said, well, I guess our siloed system here in the UK really suits you in terms of your scientific research. And he said, well, no, actually, I need multidisciplinary teams and multidisciplinary thinkers if I'm going to create innovation. Um, and if all you know about is your little bit of the world and you haven't got the context, uh, then you're not going to innovate. And you know, I, I chair a company that is um, as is capable of diagnosing malaria using iPhones, um, amongst other things. And that came about not from someone who is a scientist scientist in malaria. It was someone who is a scientist in nanotechnology and mobile technology who looked at how malaria was diagnosed and thought, oh yeah, I can. So you know, science can science works. I think when people with great expertise are able to move across their silos and into other places. Um, on the latter point, remind me what it was, because it was interesting and I've forgotten the, what I was going to say. Um, instead of, we, we use the term teachers. And, and oh yeah, okay, teacher the teacher facilitator thing. coach thing. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 um, the cliche is the, uh, the, guide on the side, not the stage on the, not the stage on the stage. Um, I mean, I love teachers. Uh, I devote my working day every day to supporting teachers. And um, uh, if my child became a teacher, I would be really proud of them. And, but that doesn't mean that teaching should be static. Now, you know, maybe we can play around with the language of that, or maybe we should just trust teachers and i think we've got more of a problem of trust in teachers and treating them as professionals yeah you know, stop treating them just as factory workers and treat them as professionals that we trust and uh, maybe that's the change i'm arguing for rather than a change in title Thanks, Jim. Um, this has been a really good conversation. I think uh, in terms of the recording, we won't have time, unfortunately, for uh, Brett and Cecilia's questions to capture on this. But as soon as we stop the recording, we can um, stay on and uh, uh, Brett, Cecilia and anyone else can, can ask a question of Jim and we can continue um, our uh, discussion. Another benefit for, for joining in real time for those of you who haven't um, done that with our club yet. Uh, so. Uh, Jim, thanks again for, for uh, taking the time to uh, do this very insightful presentation. It was a lot of fun. Um, I will turn it back to you in just a moment for a final thought. But uh, first, I um, want to uh, make sure that everybody that's joining us, all of our members and guests, uh, uh, please remember to fill out the attendance survey at the very bottom of this program page. Let us know that you're here. 
uh, participate in the discussion. Let us know what you thought. Um, uh, maybe ask a question of, of Jim. Uh, we'll ask him to, to come back during the week that uh, this recording is featured and answer some of the questions if he's available. Um, and um, uh, also don't forget to, uh, uh, to fill out the attendance survey. And uh, if you are visiting Rotarian, this will trigger um, a message over email that you can present to your secretary and use as a makeup. Um, so with this, I'll turn it back to Jim for a final message. Well, I'm, I'm really grateful for your time and your contribution. Um, yeah, the, I'm part of a, a global movement campaign for change. And um, if people are agree and are interested, then um, it's, you know, get involved. Uh, you know, talk to teachers, talk to parents, talk to schools, talk to politicians and uh, give them the political space to think more freely about how we regulate our schools. And then maybe we can ensure that all of the cocos that we have at home um, in 10 years time when they leave school are doing so really ready to thrive in this rapidly changing world. Awesome, thank you so much, Jim.